What's the lifetime of these super tall, mega tall buildings? And, and, and secondly, like, we're doing some low-rise buildings in Kathmandu after the big earthquake. And the paying clients want us to have the buildings to last a thousand years. Then I found out the concrete in Nepal is only good for 70 years. So, and, and uh, the Empire State Building had been retrofitted for another hundred years. And, and how tall, what's the tallest we can go? I think architects and elevator companies would go taller. How about the structural engineers and the MEPs and fire protection? Would you comment on that, please? Thank you. Well, I think when you talk about the lifetime design for a building, it becomes very trivial. Take, for example, uh, we design for earthquake seismic. We design for frequent earthquake, which is about 500 years recurrence. We design for medium earthquake and also severe earthquake for more than 2,600 years. The loading is already accommodating almost 2,000, but if this building can last for 2,000, it depends on your maintenance crew. For wind load, we design for 50 years wind, 100 years strength, but when you factor it up, the, the wind load is almost up to 700 years wind load. So that takes care of that, you, you answer your question. The third thing is floor loadings. We have area designed for the life load and, and the superimpose that load. Uh, but do you want to multiply another low factor to the life load to make it uh, higher than to make it 100 years or not? Um, you know, I think it is governed by the developer and the leasing agent. So in general, I just want to tell you collectively, uh, definitely this building will be at least 100 years uh, designed uh, for that. But if it is maintained right, it should last much longer. If you look at the Empire State Building, it's, been, it's finished 1931. And still standing up, right? So I think this question of what, how long this building is designed for, uh, to me, I cannot give you a straight answer. I can ask you how good is your building maintenance? Well, if you build the project at the equator, you can build. It's just a question of real estate that you have. And you can build very tall. And, you, and then you tie it and anchor it to a rock in space. <laughs> You can go very tall. Uh, I, I co-author a paper on the, the, the material limits uh, for CDBUH a couple of years ago, the, the tall buildings reference book, go out to buy it. Uh, just to give you some perspective, um, if we are using 80 MPA concrete, which is 12,000 PSI, just the weight of the concrete itself, it can go up to almost 1,000 more than 1,500 1, uh, meters. If you use a 65 KSI steel, it can go up to 3,000 something meters or more, or 4,000 meters. That's just the weight of the, of, the, of the steel or concrete itself. But now, when you do an all concrete building, we, we do a, um, a rough study, all concrete building, the column itself will allow you to build a tower up to 1,020 meters. But if you do a steel building, it can carry up you to more than 2,000 or more than 2,000 meters. Now, if you do a composite building, steel composite with concrete or metal there, you can easily go up to 1,600 to 2,000 meters. It all depends on your, on that. look at our, our, um, our kingdom tower. We try to use a lot of concrete, so we spread out the load in a very uh, systematic manner, and efficient manner. So we, we can build up to more than 1,000 meter with concrete, with a lot of bearing walls. So it is um, quite confident for us as a structural engineer to tell you that a mile tall building is within our capacity to design it, a mile tall, which is one, more than 1,600 meter. You want to push for 2,000? Two, I have to see the architectural design. I'm sure uh, Sotin's office have done this mile tall study before, okay? So, but if you want to go beyond that, 3,000 and everything, um, I, I think there's like a financial question whether it's viable. Of course, you know, if you want to be, to really make history for a long time uh, and go broke after that, you can try more <laughs> than that.
Thank you. In terms of materials, roughly what percentage uh, of the new high-rise high buildings are composite? Um, the, the present and future uh, high-rise, what, what is the trends in terms of materials? I would say that a very high percentage, 90, 95, maybe even 100 percent of the super towers are composite. You, you, we try to use, make use of the best properties of each material. Yeah, I think in addition to that, I get a project that we designed for composite. It's a 700 meter tall building. Now the owner is asking us to change it to all structural steel because suddenly the steel industry is overproducing the steel and they drop the price so much, they're dumping it. So they, you know, suddenly a steel building supposed to be expensive become cheaper according to the, their they are cost estimator that is, you know, if they will go for the uh, to, uh, steel building. Even the tower core, even the super column, they want to go for steel. I still want uh, to, to see their result later on if they make this bold decision because for all steel structural building, even the steel tonnage price may be cheaper. You have a lot of other things to deal with, okay? Uh, the, the, the building mass decreases, so you have to do, your, you have less damping, so you may have acceleration issues. So somehow you have the add stiffness. You know, how do you manage the building period? You may have to add a, a heavier t a two mass damper, okay? And also, um, it's more ductile, and you have to deal with your curtain wall uh, for all your curtain wall uh, tolerance to accommodate these high deflections. And also the, the cost of, um, of welding and erection. So everything is, is, is a combination of other factors. To answer your question, I agree with uh, my colleagues or team. Uh, most of the super high rise building nowadays we are using our composite design for two major reasons. It, you know, you get the, the two trays are giving you the best. Uh, and also it keeps the, the member sizes much smaller. Columns are working for tension and compression. You have a much smaller column or super column. Uh, the, the, the core itself is definitely good for um, uh, with, with the composite, with the shear wall, with stiffness, and also good for fireproofing. Uh, it's a good fireproofing. You don't worry about that much. It give you some, uh, 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 some beef in the core. But you also have to deal with differential shortening. Every time when we deal with a high-rise building, uh, the differential shortening aspect between the tower core and the perimeter structure has to be studied very carefully, crib and shrinkage, elastic shortening, long term, and so on. So we also have to take into consideration the structural system at that time. You look at Sotin's uh, 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 presentation, I mean, they will offer a, a different uh, aspect of analysis that may affect her decision to, to use what kind of material in order to fine-tune the building. Sartin, you brought up a, uh, on the Min Metals Tower that you designed in redundancy to uh, allow some of the vertical structure to be interrupted. And I think in, in this new urbanism and our new, uh, our climate that we have with uh, terrorism, is this something that you're seeing more prevalently, prevalently in uh, the international markets? I know it's required in New York now. What do you well, see elsewhere? Even before it was required in New York, we did that. I mean, we, in the original World Trade Center towers, same thing. There's a lot of redundancy built into it. There were head trusses, outriggers. I think it was the first use of outrigger trusses in a high-rise building. Um, the uh, perimeter moment frames had a lot of redundancy. Mm -hmm. uh, on 9-11, when two-thirds of the columns were removed in one phase, the, uh, it, it was still able to redistribute from the arching action of the Verendale that was above the impact uh, mm -hmm. to transfer the loads to the uh, remaining columns. Uh, Bank of China Tower, same thing. Um, Shanghai World Financial Center. So we do a what if scenario, you know, take out this member, study it, take out that member. We do that for mm -hmm. uh, the whole project and um, particularly for long span and high rises and iconic buildings, right. yeah. Uh, when you remove a, a member, uh, whether you and analyze, whether you 
try to do the different with the safety factors or how do you deal with the safety factors? Oh, correct, yeah. So we use a, a, a smaller safety factor. The, the purpose is to not design for the normal uh, load combinations, but for uh, uh, at a higher allowable stresses, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. The purpose is to, the aim is to keep the building from collapsing. Life safety. Right? right? So, is, yeah, life safety. I was wondering, on uh, super tall buildings, one of the concerns financially is you start a project, everything looks good in the economy, and that changes over time. So there's a huge risk for a developer to build super tall because th two years into the project or three years into the project, the market may have changed on them. A uh, fine example is uh, Spire in Chicago. Uh, right now, it's just a big hole in the ground that's been there for a while. So what kind of push are you seeing from your clients to build faster, figure out how to build faster? I mean, the Jetta Tower, how many, how many floors, a, a floor a week, floor every two or three days? Are you getting pushed from people to come up with ways not just to build it, but to build faster? Well, for, from our experience uh, on all the projects, we never have the luxury from the owner that we can build it slow. They always push the envelope to the maximum mm -hmm. because they cannot predict the, 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 when is the next economic uh, downturn cycle. They just, from day one, they will push you to, um, uh, to build as fast as possible. You can do it three days per floor cycle, they will push you. And we, we have to come up with the solution from day one uh, from our conception design. We cannot say, ah, oh, because of cycle is, is longer, we can take it easy. The bank interest rate is clicking, so we have to do it. But one thing is that uh, when you do a super high rise building, when I look at the economic model, they expect a much longer cycle of return. However, when you do an iconic development, if you do not own the adjacent properties, you're in trouble. Because usually, as a developer, they, they get involved with the master planning. They, when they build that, they already assemble the adjacent lots in the area. And they will build all kinds of buildings in the adjacent lot because this is so iconic. This, this area is going to be vibrant, to be class A, and so on. Then they will do it, and this is how they make the money fast. Right away, they get the return because you build a 30 story, 45 story condo next to it, and they are all the luxury apartment. They, they, re, they recover their cash flow right away. And while it takes time to do the, the tower, and they will finish the podium first, the podium, the retail shopping mall for the, for the super tower. That's all the economic equation to it. And then, what they, what, if they make money on all these 10 towers be, uh, around it and double, triple the investment in the retail, they have the money to, for the bank, and then they say, take your time for the rate of return. And all, also for... The, the other question they also have to study is the interchangeability of your stacking. Office is popular at the base, and then the hotel is popular in the middle, and the super luxury apartment is at the top where the billionaire and the super rich can buy it. So they pre-sell it. The middle hotel, it, it gets into the, the whole mechanical system design, the elevator design. So on some projects, I have the the requirement to do a study is what happens if they don't change, the hotel doesn't make money or they change it, how fast they can change a mechanical system into a luxury apartment. So that has been studied with all the, all the major projects we have encountered. And we, we can advise the client on that aspect. So uh, it's good that they, um, we have the provisions for that. Life load, floor loading, no problem. We anticipate that. Parking facilities uh, that are being uh, provided in these projects now, the, the use of the pri private vehicle appears to be changing. The millennials in the U.S., they don't use the cars as much. It's ride sharing. Uh, so there's been discussion now on what to do with this parking that is no longer needed at some point in the future. Are, are your clients uh, asking you to look at uh, flex space for these parking decks? Well, in, in New York, um, you need to get permission to build parking because the city doesn't want you to build parking. We are trying to keep cars out of the city. Um, but like in Malaysia or China, for example, you are required to build parking <laughs> based on your FAR and how much office space you're building, you're required to build so much parking. And 
which is really bad because then that brings in more cars into the city and more pollution. And uh, as you said, the need for all these cars will be going down. Um, I don't know, maybe uh, in, 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 um, could be used for Well, I, I, I have some experience <laughs> on that. Storage. Uh, being uh, working internationally for so many years, uh, the threshold questions, yes, the space was planted for parking based on building code requirement. However, I have seen many people change the basement area into, I don't want to call it illegal or illegal, I'm getting into gray area, into some other use, because when in the, in the, in the downtown area, in the middle of, a, uh, of uh, in the city, it's so precious already, they can change it into a restaurant or a, 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 a second tier shopping area. Mm -hmm. So where, whether they get a permit uh, or not, uh, the project I've done in, uh, in Shanghai, Nanjing Silu Plaza 66 more than 15 years ago, I'm surprised to go back and see that the place where I work as a parking space in the, in the basement area is being converted into high-end luxury uh, retail. I do not know if they fire the permit or not. I don't ask this question. Don't recall it, please. <laughs> <laughs> so they answer your questions. <laughs> There's been a lot of talk around for, for some years now around um, modular construction, designing for fabricated assembly. Uh, and the projects you put up are amazing and, and, and fantastic jobs. Um, do you see that, or I'd be interested to get your thoughts around where you see that may coming into the development of these super tall towers, the modular construction prefabricated assembly? When I was a kid, I already do prefabricated design already with my blocks. <laughs> but in reality, I mean, we talk about, it's very, very um, contradicting. We all love and understand the advantage of prefabricated structures. But so far, it still have not taken off uh, continuously. You do all know the advantage of prefab. Uh, even Broad Group, you know, in Changsha said they can build a tower within 30 days and a 100-story building within 12 months. However, there are many other economic factors, design factors, and things like that that governs uh, the use of that. If you look at even Singapore, right, they're building so many housing. This morning we saw that, you know, six towers with all this. It is a great example for prefab. I almost want to ask that question. Why not uh, consider prefabrication? It's good for embodied energy. It's good for sustainable design. I think we have to go back to ask him about that. I, I, to me, it has a lot, lot to do with the individu individuality, characters of the design for each project that basically kill or discourage the use of prefabricated structure. That's my personal feeling. Well, I think there will be more use of prefabricated structure uh, and modular construction uh, which in, for, for certain types of buildings because you know you have better quality control and uh, you can get it to the site faster. Uh, you, you, obviously, you need to have some repetition to have uh, the savings to be realized in a prefab structure. Um, again, going back to the original World Trade Center, the, uh, the floors were prefabricated. The uh, trusses with the deck with the electrical work all in, installed were lifted in place. It was prefabricated. The, f the wall panels, which were three stories high with the columns and the spandrels attached to them, were all prefabricated and brought and spliced on site. It was prefabrication in a high-rise building that we haven't seen since then. There's a new code in China right now for prefabrications. We're doing a project uh, in, in Shanghai, it's uh, mid-rise. Uh, we don't do only high-rise, we do low-rise and mid-rise uh, mid too. Uh, that is a mid-rise project and you know, we don't need high strength steel, we don't need that. However, the, the rules speculated that you have to do prefabricated uh, regulation and concrete structures is not prefabricated. And so we, we had to introduce another alternative study to use structural steel members, and they, and they accept structural steel as being uh, prefabricated, because being fabricated in a shop and being uh, erected into place at the job site. So 
whether you, you erect two beams or three beams or one beam at a time, be at, at, at this time, you know, they don't speculate at that. But I, I, I really look forward to more construction uh, use of uh, prefabricated design. I think we all have to work towards that. It's good for ML, ML environment. It's good for everybody. You just have to get the people to buy into it, and the architect and the developer and so on. Yeah, it's good for society. I'm sure with today and future, we have all these brilliant architect, consultant, come up all these uh, innovative design, engineering solution. We can go very, very tall, sophisticated, super tall tower. And as Dennis pointed out, with the demand of the uh, urbanization and also with the limited land space, so basically the planning have no choice and have to cope with the uh, heavy demand is going vertical. But I'm just trying to think myself, what is the general reaction to the uh, human being as a humanity? And we know that all this super tall, basically it's mixed use, either residence or mostly office. And for the end user, whether they have choice or no choice because of the uh, living, so they have to come to work. But treating each individual, does that mean we are going to create a new dimension of the way how we live, how we quote? That I think with a very profound impact on individual human response, social, psychological. For example, some human beings are very scared of height. So they will have kind of a phobia going up to 600, 700, 800 meter. But do they have a choice if they don't come to the city to work. So that's my question. It's in, in, in a way, how we do with humanity, you know, uh, engineering, no doubt, we will have an excellent solution. But for the community, you know, how can we balance the, 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 the so-called brilliant usage of the end product? Thank you. Well, this topic was also discussed a couple of days ago when I was in Tianjin University. Um, basically, um, the, uh, I think some people are more sensitive to heights, some will be less. Uh, and they have a choice, okay, like this housing project in Singapore, you know, it's more than 50 story, and you, I'm sure if they know their, their grandma or grandpa are afraid of height, they will choose the lower floors. Uh, I'm sure there's a choice for them, but I'm sure a lot of people, majority of people will vote for higher floors for better views and, um, uh, and, and more be uh, better uh, sun insulations. This, that's why they sell, uh, sell higher price. The elevator is another issue. So a lot of attention is being paid to elevator design, that's how stable it is, how they equalize the pressure, and the, the way they decelerate or the way they accelerate. That the minute you walk into the elevator, you feel zoom is moving, it's really scary to some, some uh, people, especially people are sensitive to motion. But if they feel and get used to it, and during a break-in period, eventually most of the people will get used to it. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think it's market-driven, and uh, everyone has a choice. It's still driven by economic uh, factors. Whether the technology of precast uh, has reached a point that we're able to, to support and to construct the super tall towers at a cheaper cost? Well, n not everything in the super tower can be precast, um, but it is likely that certain portions can be. Um, uh, the floor diaphragms, maybe. Uh, obviously, you need to be able to connect them uh, together so they act as one. Um, so there will be a, a strip in between. We call them like a pore strip, um, where you cast and integrate the two panels together. Uh, column panels, columns and beams could be prefabricated. If it's bolted, even if it's bolted, it, it's much easier to bolt it on the ground and uh, lift it up uh, as a panel, two or three stories high, with the beams attached. Um, so it is a definition of prefabrication. I think there's also uh, another factor to it. As a structural engineer like all of us, you're hired to do a job with the architect. And the architect demanded something and there's some limitation, just frankly speaking, 
we, we have to comply with many architectural design requirements and also the owner's requirement. We try, if you try to standardize many things, that will be another constraint to the design team, the architectural design team and the user's team. So if that constraint is being removed, that will facilitate or relax a little bit with the cooperation of the owner and everybody. I think the precast use will be more. Secondly, you need a contractor with all the form works, with all the, all, all the things, modular form work, that will custom fit into this specific project and they should be able to invest into this set of form work. So from day one, if, as a structural engineer, I ask the owner, I want to go for precast. I can go, I can design from day one on precast. Can you put together your, your contractor team who can work with us on that? Okay, let's try it. We work on six months, depleting our fees, and then later on prove that uh, A, B, and C disadvantage. Okay, go back to plan B, okay, to use the conventional design method. Will we only be able to absorb that impact and time schedule? Because there's no clear answer from day one whether it's good, this or that, it's all design driven. So I think we have to ask ourselves the reality. If, but if I start with a housing project that I'm gonna build 50 towers, we start day one, we plan with this way, and then with the, with the contractor and everything, everything is in line with the recipes that we all collaborate together. I'm sure we can pull it off. Okay, I'm sure we can pull it off. Uh, I did a hotel many years ago in, um, in Pittsburgh. We start from day one for a 30 story hotel building. The owner itself is a precast contractor and he wants to use precast. So even the shear wall panels, we precast the shear wall. We design it for them. So, and it, it goes right away. But then other, I never have done another, another hotel project, 35 story building for precast because it's a different conditions. So, uh, we, we don't have a straight answer, but definitely precast has a lot of advantage we love to do. Mm -hmm.